was. All right, yeah. Coach Green. First things first. How did I do? How did I do? You're looking sharp, man. Yeah, um, you like it. Most of my sem was in the wash, so I'm going with the alma mater. They're going Bearcats today. Um, but uh, you're looking sharp in that sem gear and that that that, that tribe hat. Looking looking solid. We're gonna have a season this year. Is it gonna uh, happen? I love it. I love it. Do you think it's gonna happen? Are we gonna have a season though? Yes. Yeah. Um, Abbreviated. Gonna look different. Um, you know, we got some time between now and then, but we're gonna be kids on a wrestling mat this year. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Um, the big one I'm looking into right now w with this year is Iron Man. You know, they just canceled Fargo. Was Fargo today or yesterday? When did they cancel? Uh, I think it was yesterday. It got canceled. Yeah. Yeah. So they canceled Fargo, which obviously is huge for recruiting. Which it's a it's sure. extended the dead period. Did you see that? To it July did, yeah. 31st. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where I'll find some 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 rising seniors. Yeah, for sure. So, Definitely. You um, know, Fargo. I think the writing was on the wall for that one. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to be going, man. You know, like I, I go every year. It's a little bit of a pilgrimage for, for me, but where we're at right now, I'm just going to kind of echo some of the things that I've heard from USA wrestling leadership is that we're not, we're not the sport to, to push the envelope here. Right. Um, so we got to be, be, be cautious in these early stages of, of the country reopening and not, be running around um, at these these huge events, bringing people in from all over the place. Now, now, now Iron Man is solid six or seven months away, right? Um, so I think we're gonna gonna have a better idea of what wrestling season is gonna look like in the fall. Um, and I'm 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 hopeful that if things continue to trend that the way they have, that we'll we'll be out your way in 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 December. Today, um, I saw it posted that um, – I didn't delve into the article, but I saw it posted that Michigan State would have kids in the fall, the, the, the yeah. Spartans, right? Sure. Um, and you, we're talking in one of the top five largest enrollments in the United States of America, thus probably the world, right? Sure. Um, Michigan State's got – it's got a huge student body. If yeah. they bring kids back to campus, that that's sh showing me something very positive, right? Yeah. Um, there's There's – I've been following it very closely, and 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 obviously for us, a, a boarding school, we're we're following it very closely as to what the colleges are doing. So schools like uh, Boston College is 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 said that they're going to bring up my alma mater, Binghamton University, uh, Notre Dame, um, have all recently said that they're going to have kids back on campus in the fall, um, and I think that's a good sign, right? Uh, if it goes well, <laughs> so I, I think with schools like that opening up with i don't know how it is in ohio but pennsylvania a lot of counties are moving to to green uh this week the the governor has said the whole state is going to be moved to yellow by the first week of june uh so if things continue to to trend that way and we don't have that 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 second wave and we don't wind up uh deep in it again i think we're gonna 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 see some progress in terms of of when and where we can compete how far are you from the New York line? Hour, hour, 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, real close, but How far that's upstate New York. That's like Binghamton, right? So yeah, we're two hours, area. two hours from uh, the city and two hours from Philly. So, which were, were bigger hotspots than upstate New York or, or Northeast Pennsylvania. Yeah. Big time. Obviously New York city was the, the epicenter of COVID-19 for um, sure. mm -hmm. the United States of America. And I talked to, I, I talked to T.R. Foley, and um, he had COVID-19. He lives in Manhattan. He works for UWW. You know T.R. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he recovered, and he recovered at his parents' house in Norfolk. Um, and it was crazy because it was right as ODU was dropping, and his parents have a house in Norfolk. And, and it was just – it was wild because he was right next to ODU. He was yeah. like, oh, I can see the campus from my house. It was – it kind of blew my mind. But, you know, in talking to him – just how international of a city New York City is. Obviously, I'd like to think me. This is just me being an American and a homer. It's it's the epicenter of civilization on the planet Earth to me, at least. You're not going to get an argument from me, no, for sure. Yeah, I'm a New Yorker, so. I mean, it's 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 just like, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm I'm a Northwest Ohio guy. Yeah. I live in Northeast Ohio now, but like every time I go there, you know, I go to New York City, 
and, and at 48 hours or 72 hours I'm there, you know, New York city and Vegas are just so overwhelming for me personally. Yeah. You know, and I, when I go to the city, I go to Manhattan, you know, sure, yeah. you know, there's mm-hmm. five boroughs and yeah. you know, people don't know that who've never traveled there, but there's five boroughs. And obviously the city that everybody thinks of is obviously Manhattan, right? That's it's the borough. Right, right down in the middle of where all the tourists go. Right. There you yeah. go. Exactly. Absolutely. Times Square. We do, you know, yeah. I did the, the beat the streets event Perfect. with, with beat the streets and flow wrestling and, you know, just yeah. an incredible event. I don't know if you've been, but yeah. an incredible event. And it's the epicenter. And, and you can see why New York City is really where things were because you got people coming from yeah. all the continents on the planet except for Antarctica. And probably yeah. some of those people who are scientists down there working, yeah. and they're off. I bet you a lot of them live in New York City. You know what I mean? It's, it's I'll be right. Yeah. Thing, man. Well, I think there's hope there too in terms of, uh, you know, NYU. Uh, which is right there is talking about having in-person classes uh, this fall too. Uh, So if a city with that much hustle and bustle and that much contact and that much in and out can, can recover and a major school in, in within those confines is talking about bringing their students back. um, You know, I think that's a good sign that, that we're on the right pathway. Yeah. So I'm up, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I am. I'm optimistic as well. And, and you know, like your your literature. Are you English lit? What is your actual class? Yeah, teach? English lit. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're English lit. You guys are a boarding school. I, you sure. know, I'm a public school. We're grades eight through twelve in the school I teach in. My wife teaches at a nine through twelve over here. Um, yeah. I'm at Riverside High School. She's at Solon High School, and it's like we we just you know I had a kid ask me today in an online class. He was like, "What what's going to happen yeah. in the fall?" I said, "I don't know." Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, Scott yeah. Green, you're a highly intelligent individual. Do you know what's going to happen in the fall? I don't. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, I, there's, I, I know a few things. You know, I know that we're still going to be able to to talk to kids, um, and uh, the medium that we do that in is 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 in question right now. I mean, we, and I'm sure you guys did too. We pivoted on a dime, right? Um, I think ours. We went on spring break. We extended our spring break a week and we're told, hey, you're, you are now running your classes through through uh, virtual learning. So, uh, you know, it was definitely an adjustment. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that I couldn't do in my spring classes um, that, that, that I missed. But I think there's a real kind of spirit of, of collectivism and, and a spirit of cooperation between the students and the, and the teachers at, at SEM that still allowed them to have a positive experience in their classes, right? Um, and I think with, there's a lot of scenarios that, that could take place for, for school opening in August. Um, but I think as, as an educator, now I know that I have different things to kind of plan for, right? Um, so I'm gonna be a better teacher in August, um, I became a better teacher because I had to to pivot on a dime and do these types of things, right? Like I'm a personality in the classroom teacher kind of guy, you know, and I'd get kids engaged and get them communicating and get them talking and you lose some of that when you go online. So I had to be more meticulous and I had to be better organized. I couldn't just go in there and, and wing it and get discussions going and go from there there's a little bit of that online but it's different when a kid's pressing a mute button you know what i mean there there's less engagement so it made me a better teacher um and that's the philosophy that i kind of took out of it is like okay i'm going to shore up on some areas where maybe i'm not as strong and now with some months to plan for it um if we do wind up back in a virtual situation i'm going to be better at that now too um that's not my first hope you know that's that's not what i want to happen but I'm going to be better prepared for it. And the kids that I teach in the, in the fall are going to get a better experience. Um, the best virtual experience that I can provide them. And that's all you can do. You know, my wife made the point. She said, you know, we're all first year teachers right now. Yeah. I love it. You know, yeah, like, like, how good were you as a first year teacher? I was like, not very, no, not very, no. but you know what? I worked at it every day and I, you know, I tried new things and yeah. so you throw whatever against the wall and see what sticks and you sure. learn through trial and error. And, and, and that's kind of a lot of what this has become for me. And like you said, with the mute, but the mute button's a game changer. And <laughs> in a lot of them, they can put like a moniker up. Yes. It doesn't have to be this moving picture, right? They can no, shut the video down. Yeah. No. And, and, and it's, it's wild because 
we don't have the software like a lot of the colleges do, you know, because we did sure. it. Like you said, we, took, we pivoted on a dime with Google Meet and, and Zoom, right? We're the two big ones. Yep. I don't know what you use. Same for us. Same for us. Google Hangouts and, and, and Zoom, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Google Meetings, uh, Google Hangouts, and, and, you know, we pivoted on a dime, whereas I think, I think the colleges almost have software where they can have them take a test. They have yeah. software to see what their eyes are doing. Mm -hmm. They have software to prevent cheating. They got sure. software for all this, right, to make sure. Yeah. And um, it's like what a lot of the online schools actually do, online charter schools do. Yeah. You can't get Big a flathead and put it on the wall. They do, they do screenshots and screenshots, if you didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 for sure. Um, look, the kids are better at it than we are. Uh, there's no question about that. And, uh, you know, I would have meetings with the team. Um, and so we broke it down by class. Uh, we, we wanted to stay connected. So we would do some, some, some work with the team. And you get into the freshman meeting on Thursday. <laughs> and I would look at the screen and they would all have like a little avatar of like the same kid. So I'd be looking at my freshmen and there'd be like nine of them and they'd all be the same picture you know um just because they're they're slap asses and they're 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 just ahead of the uh ahead of the curve and i'm sitting there like wait how'd you do that and i'm looking at the same kid on all nine screens you know what i mean because they they're they're, they're just better at it than us jedis so, they're jedis yeah. when it comes to technology man it's you're right you're right it's so we got some we, we got some catching up to do for sure we're in waters that you know that it's just i think this is everyone this just isn't just education we're in, you know, uncharted waters for, for our society in America as ge in sure. general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is unprecedented, un unprecedented in the sense of if you look at times of crisis, you tend to lose rights. You tend to lose liberties and rights sure. because it's supposed yeah. to be for the whole greater good of society. Obviously, you look at 9-11. If you look at the Patriot Act, which is, which is coming up again, if you didn't know, yeah. uh, there's, there's provisions of the Patriot Act that'll be coming up and, and they can let that sunset and go away or they can re-up it for another 10 years. It's a 10 year right. at a time thing. Um, and Obama re-upped it. If you didn't know that now I was an Obama guy twice. Um, yeah. Hold it against me or whatever. I don't care. But, um, <laughs> no. but you know, like when you look at these things, you know, that's something where we lost a trend, tremendous amount of liberties in regards to the fourth amendment for border crossings and airports, obviously, you know? Yeah. So we're just, it, 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 the whole society is and is in in flux right now it's just, it's crazy the economy you name it right i think that the 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 hardest part of this too is that it's 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 much more difficult to identify the enemy right um so when you're talking about a a 911 or you're talking about a wartime situation i think that people see the trade off there because it's it's there's a conceptualized person or or force that that we are fighting against and i'm certainly not all for losing liberties um but i think that it's easier to understand why that's happening if there's a, a, a an enemy that's that's easily identified now we've tried to do that a little bit here um with 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 china um and, and, and demonizing them, but for the most part, we're fighting a virus, right? So how, how that, and, 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 and obviously none of us were alive when this happened in the early 20th century, but uh, we, we don't have a blueprint for that. You know, we are, our, our, our systems of, of war and all of the things that, that we typically do when we need to rally our country, this is, this is not that situation. We don't know how to, to, to fight something like a virus. So that is even more complicating um, of, of this particular time through things uh, because it's such a obtuse kind of thing to, to, to fight against. It's faceless, it's invisible. Yeah. Like you said, you know, they've tried to pin it on China a bunch of different times and Wuhan yeah. and, and, and labeling it the Chinese virus and doing all the, and early on, they called it the Wuhan. You know, they called it the Wuhan, right? You remember that? Yeah, yeah sure, early sure. Early on, yeah. it was the Wuhan mm -hmm. yep. coronavirus, right? Yeah. And, and you know, like, I think that's, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to condemn anybody for, for, for doing that because I think that's business as usual. Like, you're trying to, 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 to figure out what is going to be the best thing to do to, 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 to demonize this thing um and we needed someone to blame we needed we needed a scapegoat uh so that that has some 
incredibly deleterious effects on on people that are in this with us. Uh, but I wasn't surprised by it, you know, um, that, that that was one of the tactics early on. But now I think we're just at the point where we got to figure out what what we're going to do next, you know, and hopefully that everybody that's involved in that decision making process is is, is working on that um, like like we are um, in our own individual sections of life. Yeah, and you find out how nimble you are. You find out a lot about about businesses and how limber they are. And, and you know, who could, and like you said, teachers did a really good job of turning on a yeah. dime. And, and mm-hmm. you really learn a lot about people and problem solving and, and what are they going to do yeah. and how do, you, how do you figure this out and, you know, how do these small businesses stay afloat and how do restaurants and, you know, they go there. We're at a half capacity right now in Ohio, I believe. Yeah, we're not there yet. But we're, getting there, yeah, yeah. we're ahead of you guys. And it's, um, it's crazy because, you know, I've gone out to eat, I think, three times now. Um, yeah. Like with my family. Um, with the Burnett's, with Scotty Burnett, and his family, and and it, it's different. Everybody's got masks on. There's a guy sanitizing everything. Yeah. Um, you don't, you know, the it's just little things, right? Um, yeah. You know the 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 ketchup caddy, ketchup sure. mustard, yeah. salt, mm-hmm. pepper. That's another thing yeah. anymore. Yeah. Those Makes aren't sense. on the table anymore. If you want something, you got to request it. Okay. So there you go. If you you know yeah. what I mean, yeah. that's a little thing right there. It's gonna look different, where, yeah. Where you know it's just. If you're me, I noticed that because, you know, I'm a ketchup man. I love me some ketchup. Not a ketchup guy. I'm a ketchup guy, you know. Tomato sugar water, right? Um, sure, right? Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. You know, it's not your deal. It's not your deal. Yeah. Look, you know, I'm not calling you out, but anybody who's over 12 that still eats ketchup, uh, they, 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 they probably need a culinary class or something. <laughs> um, I told my kid he was trying to eat. He's dipping. <laughs> we had steak with filet mignon one day. And he he was like, I want some ketchup. I'm like, you oh boy, do. oh boy, yeah. Said, you do yeah. not eat ketchup with filet mignon, you hillbilly. I was yeah, no, no, no so and he I, it. it was cool. But the stuff that you're talking about, I think, also gives me gives me some hope for wrestling, um, because I think we're built for this fight, right? Um, yeah. So you know, when 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 we had to get together and 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 figure out a way to get back in the Olympics, we did it, right? Um, I think of two things that like, I think of the, the infectious skin stuff, right? Like no other sport has had to face something like that and come up with a way to figure out how to, 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 to stop that one, um, and to police ourselves so that we were really kind of falling in line and establishing our own guidelines and skin checks and things like that. So to me, you know, that and then the, the, the weight cutting, you know, the ugliness that is, is weight cutting and, and, and our leadership's ability to establish weight certifications. Um, and, and, and we've, we've been through two, they're, they're obviously not as serious as the, 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 the COVID stuff is, but when faced with big challenges like that, that could severely impact our sport, we figured it out. Um, and we got through to the other side and that's what we need to do here is we need to figure it out and get through to the other side. So we've got some experience doing that. Um, no sport is kind of used to medical protocols and, and, and things like that. You're going to go the first time they have to tell some, some kid that plays basketball that he's out at the game that night cause he's got 101 fever. That's going to be an experience, but we got kids. I mean, are there kids out there that haven't? you know fail the skin check or haven't you know been able to like like that's a reality that they've dealt with from from day one in the sport um that there are certain things medical protocols uh descent plans skin checks things like that we're used to it um so we've got a bigger challenge than those two things presented um over the course of the last 20 30 years or so but I just feel like with the collective brain power that exists in, in, in our sport and the desire and the will that, that have kept us afloat despite some, some pretty serious assaults on our sport over the course of the last 40 years, um, we're going to get through to the other side. Um, and it's just a matter of time and figuring out that right course. It's crazy that you bring that up that the first time they're going to have a guy with a 101 fever, you know, symptoms, whatever it is. If they're, you know, a lot of people are asymptomatic, they have it. But they're going to, you know, obviously there's going to be people who show the symptoms. Everybody's different. Every human's different. Um, we have mo- so many more layers of things. You got to make weight. You got to pass skin check, mm-hmm. right? 
And then you're going to add the another. You're going to add a. They they don't even have these other two layers in any other sport if you think about it. So we've yeah. already got two obstacles to get through. Now we're going to have a third. So yeah. think about it. You know, like you said, we're built for it though. We are. I, I couldn't agree. Be in that way in line, they're going to have that thing that checks the the, the temperature on your head. Yep. You know, I mean, like that's, gun. that's probably like a gun. The reality. Next, next skin check. Next weight. You know, yep. next hair nails. You know, like like all the stuff that we're so used to um that are, are barriers to our participation um because of the nature who of who we are some other sports are going to start to feel that a little bit now um, and i think for us we're going to be like okay you know one more thing all right one more thing that we got to figure out because here's the thing you hear about guys oh he had a horrible flu he was super sick but he wrestled they're not going to be able to wrestle now guys no. aren't going to be able to wrestle at death's yeah. door where we yeah. you guys were they're too they're too tough for their own good you you know that sure. You know, that's yeah. something like a badge of honor that we talk about when, yeah. when we talk about weight cutting. We're, we're, and this is the thing, I'll tell you this. The reason our guys, our guys, I mean our guys as a whole, let's just say our D1, 2, 3 college guys, NAI mm -hmm. guys, JUCO guys, when they go into MMA, yeah. they're, 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 le they're light years ahead of all the other people they're fighting against. For sure. Because think about it. They do anywhere from 18 to 22 weigh-ins a year. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's MMA guys in their career that won't have 18 to 22 weigh-ins in the career and the life of it. For sure. So think about that. And they're doing it. We're doing the weigh-ins on one and two hours. Yeah. Right. We're doing. We're not doing. We're not doing a 24-hour weigh-in. 100. percent Yeah. And, well, and we are. We are, we are at the youth. Ironically, we are at the youth level. Um. But. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yes, we are. We are. Which okay. Yeah, I another, got another topic entirely. Sure. sure. Yeah. Let's let's leave that behind. But let's let's go to the level where I'm talking. Where we're talking about yeah. a mature man, woman. Mm -hmm. They're jumping into this. I'm a man. They're just like made for it. And they're like, oh my god, how do they guys? How do they pick stuff up so fast? And it's like you got guys like Johnny Hendricks, and you got guys like uh, Cormier and Stipe Miocic. You know, you got these guys. They got hands already. Sure. Yeah. Garbrandt's got hands already. You know what I mean? They're guys who trained a little bit of other stuff or they were just incredibly gifted and were blessed with cement yeah. lugger, just drop you. You know what I mean? Like they, sure. they're, they're freaks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and they, you know, Garbrandt had a boxing background, right? Like it's just, and, and put on 20 weigh-ins a year. This guy's, he's ready. He's made for it. Yeah. No, and we we do. You're right. We wear that as a badge of honor, um, and sometimes to our detriment. You know, um, we're the things that I've always said is the things that make us and our sport great. Um, that that exceptionalism, that individualism, that, that that we value and pride ourselves on. That sometimes gets us into trouble uh, as well. Um, when we're talking about dealing with it fitting into an Olympic program or fitting into a division one athletic department. Um, sometimes that's, that's, that's troublesome um, for, for our sport. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's definitely one of the challenges that we face. And uh, I think I just saw um, some, some Twitter conversation about that is like, you know, the, the hands on the knees thing. I don't know if you've been following that, yeah. but. Some people are just like scientifically strongly to have your hands on right. you, right? It's what they argue, it's what they said at least, right? Yeah, and I saw good good arguments on 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 both sides, right? Like people saying that is a better position to recover in, and people other people saying like that posture and that attitude that that you display is going to to affect your wrestling and, and affect your opponent's wrestling. So, you know, um, it's good to see opposing opinions on that flying around from some pretty prominent people because I think kids can learn from that but I would suspect like 10 years ago if you suggested hands on your knees you gotta get tossed out of every division one wrestling room in the country um but now we are valuing data we are valuing you know advancement in, in, in science I know I have evolved as a coach in terms of a lot of those things um so uh I think that's good discourse to have I saw Bono Bono was like yeah you don't want to show – sure, it's better or whatever. Sure, I'll give you science. But don't mm -hmm. let your opponent know you're tired, right? Sure. That was yeah. one of the ones I saw that kind of stuck out. Bono said that, right, Chris Bono? I, yeah, I think so. I, yeah. I, I so probably said, said – probably said in every practice this year, I'm like, you can be tired, you just can't act tired, you know? Um, and I, I still believe that, right? Uh, but but does it really mean anything? But Or is it a placebo effect? So who knows? But I think those types of things that – 
that generate conversation about things that we hold dearly and, and believe um, to be 100% true, you got to challenge your beliefs and you got you to gotta go back and look at things uh, and learn from them. So I think that's, that's good. It's my favorite part, favorite part of Twitter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Twitter can be a dumpster fire, too, though. For sure. Yeah. What they love. But uh, yeah. how long have you been the head coach at Sun? My 10th year. 10th year coming up. Yeah. Came right from, right, right, right from Binghamton. Um, so I think 10, 10 years, 2005 or 2006. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm an English teacher. That, I'm not good at math. Yeah. Okay. So before that, you were at Binghamton? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, were, yeah. what was your role at Binghamton? I was an assistant coach there. Um, Pat Papalizio was the head coach, and uh, Dennis Papadados was on staff there as well, Andy Saris. So and old, right, in, right in the beginnings. Yep. You had old gee whiz. Yeah. You go ahead. Yeah. First was, American, right? I was at SEM before, before Quiz came to Binghamton. We, okay. I was more of the, the Justin Lister, Josh Patterson era okay. at, at University. Yeah. How about the mm -hmm. run Lister had? Yeah. No. Awesome fun. Um, that was yeah. awesome. What did he take, fourth? Uh, he did take fourth, yeah. He was um, cradling everybody, right? He was cradling yeah, everybody, sure wasn't he? Sure did. Yeah, yeah. Far side, like, straight up, far side cradle. Yeah. It was, um, it was so awesome. Yeah. He, was, he was on fire that week. He just decided it, that, that, I mean, and I think Pat told him 100,000 100, times, like, you can, you can win this tournament. You can run deep into this tournament. And uh, he just decided that, that last month that he was going to believe it, you know, and, and you saw the results. What, a, what, a, what an exciting run for him. So before that, okay, so what, what are all – give me the, the full – first off, where would you do undergrad? Binghamton. Binghamton, yep. And then where would you go to high school? Uh, near Buffalo. Near Buffalo, or Alden High School, yeah. Alden High School? Yep. Mm -hmm. And did you wrestle in high school? I did, yeah. I was unspectacular, you know. Um, I like to say that I had a unspectacular high school career and followed that up with an even less spectacular college career at Binghamton. Um, but I knew pretty early on that 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 my contribution to the sport was was not necessarily going to be competing, but was going to be coaching. I was around some pretty special, pretty pretty spectacular coaches during that time. So I was able to to kind of learn from them and and decide pretty early that, that I, my senior year of college, I got my first coaching job. Okay, where did you go? What was your first coaching job? Uh, Newark Valley High School. In, in section four of the Binghamton area. It was about 40 minutes from where I was in college. Yep. Okay. And then how long did you get a teaching job there simultaneously? No, no. I, I went from there, bounced around to a couple different places as an assistant. Uh, my first head coaching job was at Oxford Academy, which is in the same general area. And I was teaching there at that time. Okay. Um, so I was for like, I remember the name JP O'Connor, who was an NCAA champ at, at, at Harvard. He wrestled for me at Oxford, um, okay. and that's when we we started the club, Shamrock. When did you graduate from Binghamton? Nah, 93, 1993. So from 93, right there, you stuck right around the Binghamton area. Yeah, four or five different schools as assistant coach here, assistant coach there, um, and then eventually that head coach at, at Oxford. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you get to Oxford, is that finally where you get the first full-time teaching job? Um, yeah, I had worked in, so, so I wasn't all that interested in public schools at the time. So I had worked in some, uh, some schools for, for kids who were pulled out of their home, um, in, in placement, uh, some, some residential treatment facilities. I, I really had a keen interest coming out of college and working with disadvantaged, um, kids. So I had worked for a couple institutions, um, as a teacher, as a dorm parent, uh, that was really kind of a passion for me. Um, and I was coaching simultaneously with doing that. Um, and then when the Oxford head coaching opportunity came, came up was my first, um, teaching job, full-time teaching job. Yeah. So are you 87 or 88 grad of high school? 88, 88. 88. Yep. Okay. You mm -hmm. and Eric Bernat are like literally the same story when I hear about yeah. it. Cause okay. he, that's yeah. what he did out of school. He, he worked yeah. at a group home. Mm -hmm. and that's what he did he was like a dorm person a dorm yeah like a R A R D type deal yeah it's a young oh, person's cool. job yeah like if i could if i could have done that for 30 years i would have because i had such a passion for it but you get older you have kids of your own it affects you in a different way you know so 
Um, I still do some work with, with that population of, of, of kids, but um, that was some, some pretty fulfilling, rewarding professional time in, 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 in my life. And then eventually switched over to public school. It's wild to me that now you're at this boarding school. This, this yeah, it's, boarding school, and it does you've not get any more, any huh? more different. It does not get any more. I was just going to say, you're, 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 you're end of the spectrum. It's literally what I was, <laughs> the point I was going to make. It could sure. be more yeah. polarizing, right? Like they are opposite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that, you are exactly right. Like there's no. You have international, you have an international guy on your team, right? Yeah, for sure. No. I mean, yeah. one of the best guys in the country, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we have kids that, that send from, you know, anywhere between 20 and 30 different countries, depending on the year, you know. Uh, so it's a whole, a whole different set of, uh, set of issues that you're dealing with than when you're working in a residential treatment facility or working with kids that have emotional dif difficulties, you know. Yeah, and it, Blair is similar in the sense that they get a lot of international students as sure. well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we're peer schools with Blair, like Blair, Mercersburg, Hill, like petty there's there's it's it's kind of unfamiliar to to someone who's not in the northeast you know i think like you guys have western reserve yeah um, out there that would be similar to us but in in the northeast in in pennsylvania there's a lot of schools in new jersey there's a lot of schools in new england obviously there's a ton that are are boarding schools that have been around since the mid mid 19th century that have just been been doing it this way for for a couple hundred years you know and then, you know, university school, um, Hunting Valley University School over here, it's about 20 minutes from my house. Yep. They were mm -hmm. like you guys, and then they transitioned yeah. over in the 90s to, gotcha. uh, from prep to, um, uh, to OHSA, Ohio High School Athletic Association. Yeah, we had a Bearcat from there, Jay Ingram. Ingram yep. came to Binghamton. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. um, and then, I recruited him while I was at Binghamton. Yeah. Similarly, Lake Highland Prep's doing an opposite flip. They're leaving the Florida mm -hmm. Athletic uh association fhsa whatever it is i don't know similar yeah. all they're all the similar um yeah. they're leaving there and they're coming in national prep with you guys yep that's awesome we're so excited yeah i mean that guy's a, that guy's a dynamite coach yeah up no. uh, plaza yeah plaza yeah good guy i like that guy yeah like sure that guy. really yeah. good guy i like his passion and i i tell you what he gets some freaking hammers man those guys can yeah. roll for sure they can roll and the, and the craziest thing is you know it's like being an Ohio guy, being a New York guy, being a PA guy, you're in PA yeah. now. And yeah. the culture and those three states is, it's obviously, and then, you know, you got Jersey right down the road too. Yeah, for sure. Um, the culture of wrestling is just like, you just don't, you don't see people from the South. Like you see, you're like, ah, oh, that guy can't be that good. And then nah, you yeah. see the level of wrestling, how it's jumped in Florida, Georgia, and a Georgia. lot of Southeast yeah. states, man. You know, you got uh, what do you got on your team? Uh, Arnold. Arnold, sure, yeah. The Gabe, Georgia yep. guy, right? Yep. He's a total freak. He's incredible. Yeah, yeah he's awesome. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. A, the guy is unreal. He's the next thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Next big thing, in my opinion, and I think that that's a guy you're gonna see. And you know, we we need to stay in the Olympics. I think you're looking like talent wise. There's just no the guy has no ceiling to me. Yeah, he's got a ton of room to grow. He's, he's, he's getting he's done. unreal. He's, Oh, got position, and position and heart and guts and toughness and uh you know once we once we teach him how to wrestle he's gonna be pretty tough to deal with that's what's unreal about it he's so raw <laughs> yeah, he's yeah so raw. i saw him rolling the other day on twitter at some yeah. club in georgia i was like oh my god yeah and he knows how to wrestle i mean like he just is is young you know so like raw, I, I think though. He's, he's still raw we're, we're working with with him just learning to pull the trigger and, and and being confident in his offense and once that comes man get out of the way you know because he's he's prep national champ and and he's 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 obviously placing at the ironman like all the uh, accomplishments from this year once once he gets that offense going um it's gonna be tough but Back to the national prep thing. I think that the attraction for a guy like like Palazzo, attraction for a program is like how, like Lake Highland Prep is that national prep's got wrestling people making the rules for wrestling, right? Um, and that's the beauty of an independent school. So, you know, we we were able last year to to add a girls division, um, and really kind of got worked out a couple months before. And it's not like a huge thing. It's kind of a pilot uh program um right now and and you know we had girls in every weight and there were girls from different prep schools all around and it's got a ways to go but that flexibility that we have not having a huge 
kind of over officious administrative laden governing body um like some states have to deal with we were like all right do you want to have a girls division and everyone around the table was kind of like yeah let's do it who do we got to talk to how can we figure this out and boom lo and behold we got girls wrestling at prep nationals you know um and that i think is the attraction um in in these days of you know, make, make it so hard to, to, to make rules changes and, and, and interdependence on everyone else um, to do so. Having wrestling people in charge of wrestling is, is pretty liberating. And I think that's mostly what attracted Mike to, to make the change. You're limber. Your guys is, it's very limp. No, seriously, like yeah. the way yeah. you describe that, that is literally the definition of limber. Yeah. Where these <laughs> other ones are just so sludge laborious. down and laborious, they're, they're laborious. And yeah tedious mm -hmm. and i don't know how many you're the, the english guy we could just sit here and think of yeah. synonyms for it man but oh it's just yeah. so much bureaucratic red tape and uh yeah. it's, it's insane man it like blows my mind um, yeah it's good to see progress there is progress being made and i don't envy the people that have to work within that system because i had to work within it too uh, when I was coaching in, 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 in public school, but good people are working and making good changes, but, but it's good to, to see, we, we, we hope that we can maybe pilot things and show, Hey, it can be done, you know, and then maybe people can follow that. So that's, that's, it's, it's a good situation for all the schools involved. So, you know, back to the Scott Green timeline here and the, the career okay. timeline, right? So yep. Ox Oxford, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Oxford in the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, early 2000s, early 2000s. 2000s. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how long were you at Oxford as a teacher, coach, and then you made the move to Binghamton, right? How long? Four years. Four years at Oxford, okay. um, coaching and teaching there. Uh, and then um, Binghamton, if you remember, had a year without a program, right? Um, and then the program comes back. Uh, and Tony Roby is there coaching at the time. I mean, yeah. Uh, Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So they're kind of coming up and, and, and checking out the kids that we have in club. Um, and, you know, I get to know them a little bit and Tony's like, Hey, we, we we're going to get a, a third position. Um, you interested? And I'm like, yeah, I'm interested. Of course, you know, i um, love to, to coach at my alma mater. So probably within a couple of weeks of that, uh, Tony's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to Virginia tech too. Right. So I'm like, all right. Um, interesting. So, so I'm kind of hanging in there and then, then Pat emerges as a candidate and I've known him since he was a kid. Uh, so that's a natural kind of fit to, to make the transition there and, and, and start building with the Bearcats. How do you go from, did Pat leave? And then you, what was the transition from, 2009 2010 to some 2011 to some what, what? I was the first one I was the first one to go um okay so it was Pat Dennis and I and and Andy Saris um was it was on the staff too as a volunteer assistant and then I left first uh because the SEM job became came available um and when I was at Binghamton I was running the club I was coaching on the staff but I wasn't teaching and I kind of missed that a little bit and like Wyoming Seminary, incredible institution, like, you know, like, it's life-changing for, for me, my family, my kids, everybody, so that was, a uh, you know, some people are like, why well, just step away from, from being a Division One assistant to go back to high school, and it's, it's, it's not your typical high school, and it's not your typical high school situation, so things have been rolling in the right direction here, and it was a really phenomenal opportunity, so I left. Um, 9, 10, or 10, 11, what was your first year? Uh, 10, 10, 11. 10, 11. So did you just miss McMullen then? Yeah, yeah. Mike graduated the year before that okay, I came. You just missed right. him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I walked into that situation there. And then like Dennis and Pat, Dennis, Dennis went down to UNC and then to Hofstra after that. And then and, and, and Pat went to NC State a couple of years after that. Okay. So, yep. Okay. So how many years before you won that first prep national title and the first national team title? They, 2014 you won they gave you the overall title too didn't they yep 2014 and 2020 are the two years that we've won. okay yeah 14 so. and 2020 i remember the 14 one obviously i remember 2020 yeah. as well right. um because mm -hmm. i caught you guys a couple times i love catching up with you guys it's great yeah um but when i look at um 14 that's four years man you did it in three yeah. four years three you know yeah. if you look calendar wise it was probably under four years yeah no, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think. 
Um, right? So let's just talk about that. Sure. To be able to um, unseat Blair, who you guys yeah. saw them. That was when you guys saw them a lot more, I thought. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, we used to wrestle them at uh, – we used to wrestle them in St. Anne's Gym um, at the, 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 the um, Super Quad, it used to be called. Um, and so, uh, you know – we had a really good foundation laid for us um, when we got there. Uh, and I think, you know, you'd, we, first of all, like, like Blair to me, um, they're the standard, right? Um, I've said this a hundred times is that, you know, to me, bar none, I'm not talking about wrestling. I'm talking about just in terms of athletic success, you're not going to find a better sports team in the country. Um, let alone, you know, a better wrestling team. It's like 33 prep national titles, you know, in a row, you know, every year they're, they're, they're in the, the, the number one spot or, or, or close to it uh, competing for that. So, you know, I had seen that being close enough to Blair and having them um, have it, having some of my club kids considered Blair um, growing up. Uh, so my strategy going in was to take what John Gordon had built um and just kind of learn from the way that 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 Blair did things because you know you want to get better you want to beat somebody emulate what they're doing right um so that was the the kind of strategy going in um and that first group of guys was kind of like we're not going to beat Blair we're we're going to get you know better because they had been there when a 20th you know ranking in the country was a good thing you know and 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 so you know, it took a little bit of buy-in for for kids to start to kind of believe that that we could be the number one team in the country, um, because there was a time in the early two thousands or even the late nineties before John got there and started building that Sam had six kids on their team, right? So um, we knew we had to engage our alumni. We knew the, the biggest advantage was having been a college coach and done a lot of recruiting that I had a ton of contacts. Um, so I had a instant kind of applicant pool at SEM um, that, that was gonna, gonna be there. And I had been, I had coached on the, the world team um, for, for the juniors. Um, and I had a pretty decent profile as a coach. So we were able to start to attract kids like, like, like Chris Weiler, like Nick Green and like Nikki, like, like these kids who had the ability to come in and contend for titles. Um, and we started getting them as freshmen and sophomores and they were, were, were really kind of bought into our system. So that really took off. We get a Trent Olson from, from Wyoming, you know, we get kids to start to look at Sam and, and say, man, like if I want to reach my goals, I can do it here, which I think Blair had for, for 30 years before that. So getting guys in there, getting them to believe that, that, that we could, we could do it. Um, and then, you know, really kind of following the blueprint that, that, that coach Buxton laid down um, in terms of schedule and, and the way that he trained his guys. And then adding things that I had learned from, from coaches that I had been around and, and, you know, college periodization and stuff like that, um, that, that these high school kids were like, no clue what, what, what that was all about. We got close to the top pretty quickly, um, and then 2014 we broke through, and we've kind of stayed in that top five, I guess, uh, ever since, and and we're able to to get it done again this year. What's up? Say hi to Coach Green. Good hiking today. Oh, good Ferdinand, hiking. Ferdinand had a rough day. I, I've I've heard, yeah. Ferdinand had a rough day. Ferdinand. Yeah. Ferdinand uh, wanted to trailblaze ahead, and and and. When there's waterfalls and holes to fall in, you know, and pools you know, and sieves and things like that, you got to be careful. So, uh, dad, dad got a pretty good yell at him. He, he, he learned hard today, but. Fall like, seven times, stand up eight. That's what, she, what you're going for. He's learning that, you know, but like yeah. the good thing is, you know, you don't want him to walk off something big. Yeah, for sure. Or, you know, a big fall. And yeah, he had me going. Him and his brother had me. They had it. They had the the uh, blood pressure up there. I think Scott. <laughs> oh man, I was yeah, I was struggle boss. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was like, oh. they broke me for about 30 minutes, man. I <laughs> I had to step away from it. Um, you know, learning that, learning how to get kids and see what they respond to, and getting the right kids in there, and to do it in four years, 
at a school in, you know, Northeast Pennsylvania, I mean, it, it can't be easy. I get PAs like where, you know, it's the, it's the best inter, you know, it's the best sure. high school wrestling. You know, it is the cradle of wrestling in the United States of America when it comes to the high yep. school. But you guys are almost wrestling like a different level of it. Cause then you got to yep. build a team that's going to compete with their Academy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, and then all the other prep schools, Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a gauntlet for you guys to win that tournament. Where would you say your strength came from as far as room guy, recruiting guy, uh, CEO guy, brand building guy? Where, where, where would you say Scott Green's strengths? Obviously, we know English literature is a, a big yeah. strength. You're <laughs> passionate. Seriously, yeah. you're really passionate yeah. about it. But where would you say, like, how would you grade yourself in those areas I just brought up? You know, I think communicator – um is is the most important thing uh i've been around coaches that are the best room guys um that that lose kids and families because they're unable to to communicate with them right so you can be the best strength and conditioning guy you can be the best technician um but if your kids and and and, and families don't trust you uh it's not going to go the way you want it to go, right? And you're certainly not going to go to the, the point where you're the number one team in the country. Um, so I prioritize communication. Um, and so I guess that kind of feeds into brand building and, and, and CEO as being two of my, my strengths of the, of the things that, that you mentioned. Um, I'm also smart enough to, to surround my guy, myself and my guys with, with other great coaches. Um, so, you know, um, I'm, I'm not – I'm not going to instill what I think the, the best technique is um, on a bunch of kids who come from a variety of different youth programs. Um, I think that's maybe more applicable to a school that maybe has the same kids from, from K through 12. Um, they're all going to wrestle the same style, but you're not going to bring in a kid who has other strengths. You're going to just try to find guys to work with them and work with the strengths and shore up his, uh, his weaknesses. So yeah, I think, um, those are the things that we really invested in and, and, and the strengths that I bring to the table that have allowed us to, to be a, a, a strong program. Um, keeping your own ego out of it as the head coach, I think is the, the key to success. Um, you know, um, being able to turn the room over to an assistant, being able to say, this kid's not responding to me. He's going to work with coach Ravelli. He's going to work with, with coach Hagel or, or, or whoever it is that's, that's pushing the right buttons. Um, that's who that kid's gonna gonna spend some time with. So I think those things are so critical uh, to coaching, and and they've allowed me to to have a decent run here here at Sam. So you know, I look at it. You you've got the national championship team. Uh, you guys won the Ironman, which I think you know normally when you win that Ironman, and you guys lose the duel, come back, you win preps. Mm-hmm. You're, you're you guys are it. You're the you're the standard in 2020 for you know 2019 2020. Wyoming Seminary in Northeast Pennsylvania is the standard of high school wrestling. It don't matter all 50 states, territories, you got, you guys are it. Yeah. Uh, how does someone like you find time to write so much and create content and still be able to have an opinion and not be so wrestling centric? You know, I talked to Todd Haverdell. He's the coach yeah. of a good friend of mine. You know, I'm good friends with a lot of these Ohio guys, right? You know, Eric Burnett, obviously sure, yeah. a lot of the St. Ed's guys, good friends with them. Um, but, you know, I, I, I talked to those guys, and so many of those guys are just their tunnel vision on wrestling. Todd Haverdo brought it up. because I go, Todd, what do you do? You know, like, Scott, I know you like to hike, as you call it, social distance, yeah. being socially distant or whatever you got. You say some funny stuff, but, you, man, you go to some beautiful places. You're doing all this other stuff. You're a renaissance man of sorts, as I like to say. <laughs> You're so well-rounded. Whereas, like, Todd Haverdo is like, he's got daughters. Yeah. And I asked him what his hobbies were, and he's like, I don't have any hobbies. Yeah. You know, well, Greg Urbis. I don't think Greg, Ur- Greg Urbis had a lot of hobbies. I'm not knocking these guys. I got a ton of respect. I hear you. Yeah. But, so, like, what, yeah. How do you, how are you able to just have so many irons in the fire and have so many, you know, have an opinion well, about everything? I think that, that well, I mean, certainly the hiking has been a new development, right? Um, so I've, I've made some, uh, some, some changes recently. Um, and, and that's been part of that, right? So that, that hasn't been a lifelong thing. It's been something that's picked up and it's picked up quite a bit during the, the shutdown. So I haven't been able to go to wrestling practice, right? <laughs> so, so there's, there's uh, you know, some of the element of that is, is due to that. But I think 
the people who are are getting through this the best right now um they had balanced in their life before before they they got into this right um and and so that has always been something that's 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 been important to me one of the things that i say all the time is that and and, and sometimes a kid won't appreciate it until um years later uh but there's 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 more to wrestling than wrestling right um and and that's that's interesting but like so like we'll go to a tournament in niagara falls new york right um and i'm like all right guys uh getting here early you know we're taking the tour bus and we're going we're going to walk and we're going to see the falls and they're all like they want to go to their rooms (laughs) and play video games and get down to weight and and all that stuff i'm like no we're going and we're going to do this and so like just happens the weekend that we're there it's like negative 20 degrees right <laughs> and we're all like walking from the bus to the falls with the only idiots out there <laughs> and, and <laughs> we're and, gonna do this <laughs> and we're walking to the falls and like like darian roberts is looking at me like coach he's like we really don't need to see a frozen river <laughs> but, but then like a couple years later he's like man that was a pretty cool trip you know um so we get out to to the the garlic city rumble a couple of years ago um and we're wrestling gilroy we're wrestling buchanan montini's there and we're in the hotel and i'm like oh man we're going to see like the redwoods we're going to see the old growth forest we're going to go to san francisco and go, go down to the pier and, and and some of the guys are like man like i don't want to do that but when we do stuff like that kids will point to that as something that they remembered later um maybe even more so than they can tell you. Like there's nuts like like me, you know, my wife is always like, how do you remember like the quarterfinals of the tournament from 15 years ago? And that's just the way my brain works. Um, but, but kids are more likely to talk to me 10 years after they graduated about something like that than they are about you know, a particular match that they remember. So I think that's important. It's always been important to me um, to have that type of balance and to use wrestling as a vehicle to see places that you might not normally see, to travel to places where you might not normally go and to, to learn something besides wrestling from our sport. Um, and so we try to impart that in, in, into the kids as, as well. And, and that's, that's the only way you can do it is, is by doing it yourself. So I think showing them balance will, will help to, 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 to have them value it as well. I have zero regrets about any place I've ever been and done this, you know, and, and gone and done work. And, you know, I, I've done, I did the Hawaii thing that they had that, uh, the one mm-hmm. thing they did in Hawaii, the rumble in paradise, whatever it was with yeah. Oklahoma, Minnesota, Oregon state, American U. Um, you know, and I went, I, I did eight days there, man. I had a blast. I was jumping yeah. off the cliff. Yeah. I had sure. a blast with it. You know, I go to Reno Mm-hmm. I go to I go to Tahoe. I go over the pass. Yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, yep. I go somewhere cool. I go to Oregon State. You know, that was how my my nephew and I we were going out, and I was doing coverages at Oregon State. Yeah, I built this relationship with Kevin Roberts. You know, and then he got yeah. Ian a job out there. My nephew Ian's, and then you know Ian right. can get uh, you know brought in on the staff for Pendleton. You know, he just spent four awesome. years of his life out in a beautiful place. You know, and then yeah. someone who's really gotten it. You know what I mean? Like he he really gets. Yeah. The, traveling and seeing places and it's it's awesome it's a huge part of it and you know going to russian nationals just the things yeah. that joe williams and i went and saw were just like yeah no you value that you know, like, like yeah I, I i was fortunate enough to spend a month in, in in russia in 1990 you know and wrestling allowed me to do that and and sure like i remember the training sessions and i remember the the guys that we worked out with but it's the other stuff that that, that i'm able to to teach my kids about or to, to, to bring into non-wrestling conversations. Um, that, that is the, the value of that trip. So I think that's, that's been, there's more to wrestling than wrestling. Right. Um, and, and that would be, I like love that, that that's something that you put out there. There's more to wrestling than wrestling. And I yeah. think that so many people are focused on winning. Mm-hmm. So many people are focused on getting a bunch of matches. Yeah. And, and getting a bunch of mat time and, and they like, they really lose focus yeah. of we're trying to build someone, a better person at life, a person who when this ends someday and they can't hit a, you know, a head outside shot or a head inside single leg that we're going to need them to be a productive individual of society. And there's so much more that comes along with it. And I just, I really feel bad for all the people who, uh, who, who miss out on that. You know what I mean? And, 
there's a really good kid to get sour on it or don't like it and, and they fall out of love with wrestling and I think a lot of that is because they're not getting a lot of the things you and I are talking about like the experience right. you know like I don't need I don't need kids that graduate from Wyoming seminary to go on and be wrestling coaches right like I need them to to get on and, and somewhere they're going to make money so they can donate it back uh, and, and sustain this program, right? <laughs> so hey, you want so, I do figures. You want you want kids to go to the yeah, sports okay. academy. No, you for, you for want to sure. get kids yeah. to go on and do uh, things. And, and and listen here, hey, maybe they go and they uh, they go and they're a carpenter. Well, we know yeah. the, the the nature of of wrestlers. They're going to go and be the best carpenter, and they're probably going to start their own business, and they're going to put yeah. themselves in a position to be able to donate money back or. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're going to elevate their, their stay, special class. Stay right? connected to the sport in some way. Listen, sure. like, uh, not a lot of people know this, but, uh, you know, Sam Wrestler it pretty much invented and, and founded the, the wrestling mat, the, the company Resolite, you know? Um, know that's, that. that's, yeah, that, that, that's a Sam Wrestler. And now, you know, our kids walk into the room and see Tischler's name up on the banner every year, you know? Um, and they're like, wow, I'm part of something bigger than myself, right? Um, Frank Carlucci, Secretary of Defense, Sem Wrestler, you know, Prep All-American. Pretty good. Um, you know, they, they walk in and they're like, wow, I can, I can do that. I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And then you get a guy like, like Joey McMullen, who is, 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 you know, behind shot sled now with his, with, with his partner. So, you know, like that, that, that tradition, um, is, is really something special to be a part of and our kids being able to see those names up on our, our wall every day when they come into the, to the great hall is, is, is pretty remarkable because that makes my job easier in reinforcing that message, you know, um, that these are guys that contributed in wrestling. None of them are Olympic medalists, but, uh, they're, they're, they've left a legacy in the sport, you know, um, or on the country in, 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 in the case of Carlucci. So, that I think reinforces that message that I'm trying to put out there. And I think the kid that leaves Sam after having been in the program is, is ready to, to understand that. Say so, you know, that has obviously got a lot of that going on too. Yeah. Oh, the elite gosh. programs you look at, they got guys that are, yeah. they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're, sure. yep. they're doing something special with their lives. And, and, and consequently, I, I guess not coincidentally is what I should say. They all give back to wrestling. For sure. They're all, mm -hmm they're all still deeply involved in the sport, even if they're not involved with the sport. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, that's, what's impressive to me. It just like suit just, I, it impresses me to see like what people go on and do and what they give back to the sport of wrestling. And yeah, uh, yeah man, it, it, it's awesome to see. Um, uh, the sport of wrestling, it just has so many people that uh, maybe they weren't great wrestlers, Scott, maybe they weren't, Prep national champ. Maybe they didn't win the Ohio State tournament, the PA State tournament, but man, they sure are do a really good job. And this is kids in general, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you want. They take what they did with wrestling and they apply it to practical life. And then yeah. that's really what it's about, man. That's really what all yeah. the the growth and everything's about. Um, we are in like a media boom time right now for wrestling. That's that's I, wonderful too. Because I, think, I love it. I love it. You know, you know those I, guys that you're talking about have the ability to stay connected to our sport like they never have before. It's amazing. You know, and that's sure. like if you look at like what Tony Hager does, he does a thing called Happy Hour. Yep. They, you know, I, first off, I got to give a lot of those guys credit. I got to give Jason yeah. Bryant credit. I got yeah. my backyard as a studio. You know, <laughs> I got a backyard, which I got a pretty sweet backyard. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, those guys got professional studios. They're set up. Yeah. Um, they're cranking out. They've got the guests. They're just hustling. They're getting Mark Bader hustles so hard, man. You know, yeah, 100%. guys work really hard at it and they got a studio and they're, it's, they got a person on a switchboard and they're doing audio and it's a polished product and it's incredible. Right. Yeah. These guys do a really good job of it. But like, as far as our, a boom time of wrestling, how often are you on podcast? How often are you, you know, people talk to you and want to know the secret to your success and, how you got it done and and obviously it was a lot of stick to it man you yeah there were probably a lot of times where you're like i don't know why i'm doing this anymore 100 percent, yeah for sure um so i i i love all those guys that you mentioned right um and i i do a lot of interviews um for sure um if i'm listening to a, a podcast uh 
it's, it's, it's probably not going to be wrestling related, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I'm more apt to, to listen to, to something else. And, and we do that with our kids. We do the podcast of the week and we all listen to it. And every once in a while, it's a, it's a wrestling thing. Um, and we consume that type of content, but we're more, um, and, and, and my personal preferences are, are more listening to things that are gonna be things that I can take into my, my practice and they'll show up in my coaching and I can send them to the kids. So like the, just an example, a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, the, the podcast of the week for the team was, a, a, a podcast with Alicia Keys, um, who, I mean, to be honest with you, I, it was, it was on my list of recommended podcasts. I listened to, it, I was blown away. Right. And I probably couldn't even tell you more than two Alicia Keys songs, but uh, just talking about her story, her journey, um, you know, the way that she evolved as a, a, a singer. And I sent it to the kids and the kids were all over it. They were like, oh, my God, that was awesome. Right. Um, so I think you got to consume outside of the, the, the sport, too, just like, like we were saying. Right. There are, there are certainly like one of the things that I remember a kid being a freshman in our program and just like one of the seniors coming over to him and saying like, look, you just can't sit on your phone and watch wrestling until your eyes bleed. Right. Uh, you gotta, you gotta get off that for, for a few minutes and, and, and buy into to doing something else. Um, but that being said, our ability to scout, our ability to learn, our ability to, uh, you know, um, consume content has been, where we are at the gilded age of it right now and there are so many genuine great wrestling people out there that are putting things out there for the kids to consume and for for the coaches to consume that you can get overwhelmed by it um, and then it becomes a a, a sorting out thing you wouldn't you know like I, I look at all the those guys do a tremendous job and I, I my thing is like I can listen to like a, a three minute snippet of Joe Rogan or something. You just don't seem like a Joe Rogan guy. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Uh, n n not that there's anything wrong with that. No, but, yeah. No, I mean, I'll, yeah, for sure. If it's, if the guest is interesting, I'll listen to the whole podcast. I to him, but there's a lot of uh, different ones. Um, you, there's all these different ex, ex Navy seals. Jocko, sure. does Jocko have one? He does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So there, it's, it's this golden age of really getting these long format, interviews from people right like yep. you and i can sit and, and talk about it iron man and you can tell me about how you thought, thought blackman yeah. did how gabe did you you know and, and who you got surprise performances out of and how you yeah. thought you did it to super quad and this sure. that, and the other and, and you know we can get a four or five six minute window right but yeah. these long format things i learn so much about people but like yeah. you said it can become overwhelming as well it's yeah. just like, there's so much information out there scott it blows yeah. my mind um rockfin you've been putting a lot of your con content on rockfin this is a rockfin uh yeah. you no know, long format however you want to call it whatever it, podcast doesn't matter to me yeah. but why, why rockfin what was your belief set in that and what did you like about what rockfin was doing i i love i i am a huge believer and 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 i'm a big martin loyalist you know um and so you know, Willie had kind of jumped over there and it started putting some stuff out. And he and I went to uh, watch the Steelers Bills game. And we had a, like a nice little ride out there to to kind of talk about it. And he's like, "Hey, you got to talk to to, to Martin." Um, so you know, I I talked to him and and I said, "Look, like this is what I want to do. Um, I'm I'm more of a writer by by trade. I certainly will put some video up there and and, and stuff like that." Uh, but do you think there's going to be a market for it? And he's like, yeah, I do. Let's see, you know? Um, and so it gave me an, an, an outlet. Um, and I certainly still post things on Facebook and, and Twitter is that kind of quick hitter uh, where, you know, you're, you're engaging people um, with you, with your tweets, but, but just like you're talking about long form podcasting, long form writing was very appealing to me. Right. Um, so you know, some people, when they feel like they're going crazy, they go out and go for a run, right? And, and, and some people, when they think they're going crazy, uh, they, they get in, they go in and drill. Um, for me, that's always been writing, you know? Um, so once I was kind of convinced by those guys that there'd be an audience for it, um, and people have told me that before, but I was kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know? Um, Andre Bartlett, Bo's dad, is like, you got to do this, you got to write, you got to do, do that. And I'm like, 
you know, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But once once Martin kind of talked to me and Willie talked to me and, and some of the other guys that are with them right now and were like, yeah, we think that people would would like it. Um, I was like, all right, we'll give it a try. And then, you know, the first couple articles, I got so much positive feedback on them that I was like, all right, this is, this is something I can do. And I like the fact that it's not a job. Um, I like the fact that it's, it's something that I can post on when I, when I want to, um, you know, uh, and then if I go a week without a post because I'm doing something else, I think that's okay too, uh, for me. Um, so it's been an incredible experience being able to, to put some of my ideas out there in a way that I can articulate them in more than 280 characters or, or, or more than, you know, a, a Facebook post with a, a limited audience and, I'm enjoying it. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. And there's so many other good creators on there that that's the same thing. You get to learn, learn from them. What's it like sharing your gift? You know, you got a gift that, you know, there's some people I was talking to, they were like, man, we want to hear more, more from the Scott Green guy. That guy, he's an interesting guy, yeah. super intelligent. And he's got a lot of great insight and being able to share yeah. it, having more of an outlet. That's just like you said, Facebook's just the people that are your audience. And sometimes right. I don't know if you got the privacy settings and I, you know, like we could hit yeah. We can hand our phone to a kid and they could fix that, right? But <laughs> exactly, as far yeah. as us, you know, like some of the stuff's very limited, right? Now yeah. you're putting it on a, a platform where thousands of tens of thousands of people can see it. What's it like sharing it and knowing that, hey, man, it, that felt good. That felt good to get that out. What's that like for you? Coach? It's rewarding, right? It's like a little bit of uh, you get that, 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 that quick natural high when someone comments on your stuff or, or you used to get that the beginning of Twitter. Like you get that retweet and you're like, oh, yeah. That good. dopamine right. release? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like this has been a little bit of an evolution for me, but, uh, the, 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 the number one team in the country got a platform here to, 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 to lead a little bit, right. Or to get ideas out there. So I remember the first time I kind of saw that and thought about it is the year that we decided that we were going to, purchase two piece singlets right um and someone had said to me they're like look if if a couple schools go go and wear two piece singlets at the iron man it's a not it's an anomaly if wyoming seminary does it then all of a sudden it's an idea that gets traction and people are going to be talking about it and i was like oh yeah you know i never really thought about that um so i was like start to take that a little bit seriously and not look at it as just an opportunity, but maybe a little bit of a responsibility too, right? Um, that, that you're in this position that you can affect change. Um, and then that became most real and, and most important when we, we established the girls program, right? Um, because uh, that was something that had always been important to me with our as girls in club and things like that. Um, so I was like, look, like if we can get this done, that's gonna, gonna be very attractive for other schools to maybe follow suit. And, and it's going to get some publicity if the, the a team like us is, is starting a girls program. So I see like writing and Rockfin and, and interviews like this as an extension of that. Um, where, you know, this is an important position and this is always this important time in, in, in our sport. Uh, so I can't be silent. And most people that know me would say he's, he's never silent, right? But, uh, but I have to, to, I have a little bit of responsibility to be vocal about the things that I believe. Um, and some of them are going to be met with like, yeah, what the hell is he talking about? But, but, but hopefully they're going to stimulate conversation. Um, and, and, you know, uh, hopefully I'm, I'm approaching things judiciously and, 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 and fairly, uh, but I'm not afraid to, to offer up an opinion on something. Um, and I think that's important for, for all coaches, but, but especially someone in a high profile program, like, like ours. You know, being in such a high profile uh, position, you know, you got the best high school wrestling team in the country. You've done it twice in the last six years, right? Um, when, when did it come uh, be, become apparent to you that you were going to change your lifestyle and you make this just, just this crazy transformation, man, from, from last year's Ironman to this year's Ironman, two different Scott Greens. There's a, two, yeah. a tale of two Scott Greens. Yeah. When did you, when did you decide, like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change, I'm going to make a change in my life? Akron. Akron, Akron last year, a year ago. 
Yeah, yeah, Akron. What, um, just, uh, just kind of driving out, and you know, I mean, you're 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 overweight. You're 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 not feeling great. You you start every Monday, right? <laughs> you're gonna start, you know. So I'd had that conversation probably a million times in my head. Um, but I think for for whatever reason, we didn't we didn't do as well. We've always got a kid in the finals. Always got a kid on the world team, you know. Um, or, or at least in the wrestle off, uh, in, in, in Greco or something. And I remember driving out and, you know, you're, you're always in the car, you're thinking about that, but on the way back, I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta make some changes. I gotta be a little better example. Um, I gotta, gotta be my own coach, um, to, to some extent, you know, like, got to tell these kids this, this stuff and, and being the best version of themselves and they have balance in their life. Got to make some, some changes to establish that for, for yourself too, or we've been, I'll be 50 this summer. Right. So, um, you know, uh, it, it just became on that ride home from Akron apparent to me that, that this was, this was the time it, it was now. And so got to work and, uh, made those changes and, and here we are today. How much would you say is diet, working out, regiment, how much, what, what, what would you break the percentage down to or, or where did you focus? What was your biggest focus? Um, established working out first. Um, thought if I could get into some good habits of that first, uh, then could work on the food part of it later, you know? Um, so I would say 60, 40, um, because you obviously have to, you can't outwork, a, a in an atrocious diet. So, uh, had to, to work on that, but, you know, had some summer, um, after Akron to, to really kind of work on it. Uh, I do work in the summer in the admissions office a little bit, but, um, you know, it's, it's definitely less than than my teaching load so I was able to to really work on it in the summer and then just kind of catapult it into the season and then you know like kids got excited about it when they came back to campus so it was easy to to kind of have them push me and and continue to to be in a, a good place what was your workout what's your favorite what's your thing walking I really biking Don't do anything. I, I walk or I, I bike a little bit but mostly I just walk you know um, what what's the what what would be the walking regiment like what were you doing an hour a day what half hour a day what is the yeah probably at the beginning probably 30 minutes um to this week on a weekend now i'll go three hours you know walk uh, three hours yeah no uh, on a weekend yeah oh my god yeah no, oh, are you guys uh, seven eight miles yeah probably probably eight yeah um Dude, you're yep. killing it uh normal day is is more like a a 3.5 in the morning um yeah, good for you man yeah no just walk huh just just walk is there a heart rate like what are, how are your joints are your hips Depends. and knees great? you're getting there you know that's why i don't do anything else because i'm afraid of what what all those years of torture in my joints and stuff would be so you know like maybe at some point i'll pick up something else um, i do bike a little bit too to change it up and i do do quite a bit of yoga um but uh you know, if I, if I walk three and a half miles, I'll try to get that heart rate up on a hill or something like that. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in a hurry, you know, uh, just trying to get out and enjoy, enjoy some quiet, uh, quiet, quiet your brain. I'm always telling kids it's the most important key at a tournament is finding the ability to quiet your brain. And that's the way that I do it, you know, um, is to, to get out there every once in a while. I'll, I'll, grab one of my kids or my wife will go with me but but i'd say 80 percent of the time it's it's just the ability to be outside of the i mean social distancing before it was in vogue right <laughs> get out there and uh, yeah, I, I, I like to do that now you know if yeah my wife and i we're the only two caregivers here right like my mm -hmm. mom and dad no her mom and dad nobody lives around and my brothers and my sister and, and her yeah. sister, she she's my wife's from ann arbor and you know we're Yep. We're two two and a half hours away from anybody so it's you know it's one or one or the others giving the care to the children sure. so yep. one of them's got to be with the kids at all the time so yep. when i can get out now yeah it's like to get out there and it's nice yeah. with my kids when they're not running ahead or you know one's sure. walking yeah. off a cliff or you know what i mean like trying yeah. to you know what i mean like it's usually pretty relaxing we do it on a day today's the first day i've really had a problem like when you guys when i post something on social media it's usually how the day is going Today I lost my mind. Like I was screaming. <laughs> yeah, like today was very out of character. And it's gonna be on the cutting room floor of those videos, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just today was very uh, 
very un Ferdinand, very un Thomas. And, you know, there's like a little bit of like hey, testing boundaries and stuff. Today, mate, he like, Ferdinand lost his mind. And, and, yeah. You know, but, but, you know, mostly they're really good kids usually, but whew, today was, it was a test coach green. It was, it was something else. Um, you know, you talked about podcasts. What's your favorite podcast or top three or, you know, I think that's something where I, sh- I should have followed up, but yeah. what does Scott Green listen to? to and, and do you calm your mind at all, whether it's, or is silence calming your mind? Sometimes. Um, I don't listen to podcasts on walks. That's more like a sauna kind of thing. Um, so uh, Jay Shea, um, the monk, you know, the, that, he's great. Um, listen to those a lot. Uh, kind of kind of try to mix it up. I do listen to um, a lot of uh, Buffalo Bills podcasts. Uh, Buffalo guy, born and raised. Bill's Mafia. So, yeah, Bills Mafia. So I listen to a lot of those uh, podcasts as well. Um, but I try to mix it up. It's not like I got a go-to list or anything like that. I'll listen to uh, – sometimes I'll listen to books on tape um, in the sauna um, through, through podcast form and stuff like that. Do you hit the sauna every day? Pretty much, yeah. So the sauna, do you have your own or? or do I do, you, yeah, no. So you, um, got, I, you got an infrared or what do you got? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, whoa, whoa, I didn't mean, to, you're a bit of a sauna snob, I see, okay. <laughs> yeah, almost having barrel sauna, um, Finland style in the backyard. Um, Harvia, uh, Peter. Um, we sauna at the same, same temperature that we, uh, we smoke brisket at. All right. Um, it's gotta be hot. Uh, so. Do you go 185? Uh, nah, a little higher. 205? I mean, what I don't you, know if the thermometer is accurate. What do you hit but, every uh, day? What, like, what are you trying to hit every day? 220 for, for at least, for at least five minutes. <laughs> Um, you get delirious at all, or are you drinking the whole uh, thing? Nah, I pound in the water, a gallon yeah. of water in, in that hour, you know? Yeah. So you hit an hour. Well, not not, not when, during shutdown I do, <laughs> but but sometimes it might be 40 minutes, sometimes 20, you know? So do you, okay, so before you, you made the transformation, were you saunaing as well? Not as much. It was okay. not as easy to tolerate. But sauna, right? it, it does a really good job. It keeps your joints. Yeah. You know, I, it's really good for the joints. I th- I like it for recovery personally. Yeah, you know, it's a different experience than when you were a kid too. Like you, you, people have those sauna flashbacks of being dumbasses in like rubber suits and working out. Like you just go in there now. It's good for your skin. It's good for your blood pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think like of 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 our coaching staff. I'm probably like I'm I'm pretty highly ranked in in sauna. Um, but uh. I'm going to give it to her. Aaron, Aaron Vandiver is the, the top ranked sauna person. Like she, she could set up a, a house in there. You know, she, she could be in there all day. I cannot beat her. Um, so, I don't want to have a sauna competition with anyone. Yeah. Lee yeah, Fritz. Yeah. I, I sauna with like, I believe yeah. I with him. He likes, he works out in there. Yeah. He curls and does all different no. spots. He's nuts. Um, I, I only usually sauna. Like sometimes when I get out the legend of gold, I like to catch a sauna. If I can catch a sauna, but I only get to sauna like every other month, maybe. Oh man! No, I no, want to no. go every day though, and I just so, might start out. So I might maybe. start out with an infrared. Just okay. No. no, that's all right. Yeah, no. Um, just don't you know? Don't wear like a schmedium shirt in there or, or or something like that. And if you you know, uh, so there's a. This is interesting too. Um, there was a survey in Finland about a health survey and they, they had different categories of how often during the week to use sauna and they didn't even have a category for zero or one because no one in Finland would say <laughs> I don't have a sauna. Right. So like the category started at twice a week, you know, yeah. and went right up to like 10 times per week. So. Oh, um, yeah. I, I really like sauning. I think it's cool. I, I not cool. It's hot, but it's I think there's so many like healthy properties to it personally. Like, yeah, for sure. Sure. Uh, no, our coaches are, uh, we call it uh, this, this, uh, not everyone loves the name, but we call it the, the men's bathing club. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it conjures up some imagery, uh, there, uh, it's not exclusive. Like I said, Adeline comes in when she's in town all the time. Um, and, and, and Aaron lives right across the street. So she's over pretty regularly, but, uh, yeah, the, the bathing club, it, it's, it's, a it's pretty exclusive and you gotta be, gotta be ready to go. All right. Well, uh, 
I, you know, obviously we're going to hook up again here and, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I love talking to you. I like talking to you. know what? It's always, uh, I like to attach myself to someone a lot smarter than me. I'm a big fan of that. I like talking to people who are like a lot more intelligent than me. Um, cause I'm not afraid to learn. I'm a fan of that too. I think I'm that, um, learning. I'm also not afraid not, to be wrong too. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a, I, disclaimer. Yeah. I'm not afraid to be wrong. Yeah. No, like I'm, I'm a fan of that too. I'm not afraid of being wrong. Um, and I think it's, it's vital to, to, to growth is to, to, to that, that good to great concept, right. Where you're learning from errors to be human outside of your, outside of your field. Um, like that, right? to errors to be human. Did they do that? Sure. One? Hey, oh, you get some credit there. Yeah. I got, okay. I tried. Yeah. I tried. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, what's the book you're reading right now? What's the book I'm reading right now? Um, let's see. I got two going usually uh, at all times. Uh, so that's. <laughs> so, I, so, just give me one. Well, I got a little fiction going right now. Um, I am actually reading. I started because I said the whole summer to do it. The Science of Shannara by Terry Brooks. It's a fantasy fiction kind of novel. I read them when I was. Uh, 12 years old um and i'm going back through them and they are they are they are monsters they are they are big big bears how um, deep are you right now um about three four chapters from the end so but that's a that's a whoop that's that's like a 600 pager right there so all right i got one more for you here one more yeah. get over here let's go hurry up we got one all right let's go thomas let's go get over here thomas is a real piece of work here yeah Let's go, Spider-Man. Come here. Come here. I want to see it. Come here. Oh, this is Thomas. Thomas, what you got there? Spider-Man, huh? Yeah. yeah, we are watching Miles. All right. Oh, I'm hey. I'm watching Spider-Man right now into the Spider-Verse. Best Oof. Marvel movie there is. I'm, just, I'm putting it out there. Oof. Um, Best you're Marvel, I'm, tell I'm telling you for me personally. Oh, okay. Into, I'm telling you, Into the Spider-Verse. Okay, I thought you were asking me. It is the best Marvel movie there is. I thought you were going to ask me because I would be in trouble um, as far as that goes. Because uh, I wouldn't. I don't think there are any of them are very good, to be honest. I don't know the difference between the two different worlds. and. Oh, DC and Marvel is what you're saying? Yeah, no, no clue. Yeah. No clue. I would say that this one, the Into the Spider-Verse. It's like a, it's just everything the create I, everything about it. First off, the soundtrack is incredible. Um, if you know, like even for like kids' music now, like hmm. you know, different hip hop, whatever it is, right? It's really good. And then they write it. There's a lot more comic imagery to it. Okay. And they use the onomatopoeia. Like it's just it pops. It's just really it. Yeah, I think it's their best Marvel movie ever. It's a kids show. Uh, I could watch it all okay. the time. That's the stage in life you're at right now. Yeah. You're going you're, you're um, to consume a lot of that stuff. Yep. It's, it's a bunch of, it's all these dimensions of Spider-Man coming together into one in Brooklyn. Okay. They're traveling all these different Spider-Man through, hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, time. Are, they're time traveling from dimensions, and it's just like, it's really good. It's, it's huh. really good. And New Miles is a kid named Miles Morales, and he, he – uh, goes to Brooklyn Visions Academy. Okay. All right. It's a, it's a great storyline, actually. It's pretty good. Yeah. He, you know, he figures out, oh, I got bit by a radioactive spider, you know. Got to figure out how to watch movies in the sauna, and I'll be all set. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, hey, you got, you got anything else before we cut out? No, I think we got to flip the tables next time. Next time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop on and interview you. Whatever um, you want. And then, Whatever uh, you want. I, we, we'll, we'll, this goes both ways. The shoe we'll is keep this going. Way. We'll keep this going, and hopefully we'll be interesting enough that a, a couple people will make it to the end of this interview and uh, have, have some nice comments about it, right? Yeah. Hey, do you guys do a hoodie? Do you got a hoodie? Um, I got to check the new gear order, but I might, yeah, yeah. You got a Fat Man Double Locks hoodie? I, we got lots of Fat Man stuff, yeah, for sure. I'll have to check into the, 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 the buckets over at the Great Hall when we're allowed back in. All right, Coach, I'm going to cut this interview. Let's talk a little bit off camera here. and uh, Okay. Sounds Man, good. Thanks for the time. I'm going to upload this to Rockfin tonight. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I'm looking forward to watching. I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there for you, too. All right. Coach, thanks.